Johannesburg. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dominic and Mark. I want that one. Hello, everyone. Oh, wait, I've got to look over here. <laughs> Thanks, Dov. I don't even know where you are. I can just hear your sarcastic voice. Thank you for, for coming. So today we're going to talk about um, attacking and defending stuff at scale. And there's really two, well, there's one concept we want you to take away from this talk, and that's ideas that you can use to sort of architect or design systems at your organization so you don't fall prey to the stuff or the mistakes that we, we have. So the first part is going to be me talking about how we hack things and with a little bit of a slant towards containers and scaly, cloudy things. And the second part is going to be a bit of a case study from my, my partner in crime there, Mark, about stuff that he's done that looks like it mostly worked. <laughs> so we work at a company called SensePost, which is a penetration testing company based in um, Pretoria is where we started. Started in a bedroom in Centurion 18 years ago. That's the bedroom. Um, and we're, like I said, we're a penetration testing company, so we break into stuff so that you can fix it and make it, make it better. So if we're talking about hacking, we probably know what we talk about. If we're talking about anything else, we're just making it up. All right, so I wanted to draw a graph, and I thought I'd be, like, really edgy. So that's a graph. You see, it's, it's not a seesaw, it's a line. Um, and the point I wanted to make here is that scale aids uh, attackers. So we sometimes describe hacking as looking for the one place that somebody is screwed up which means hacking is long hours of spelunking around looking for where somebody's made a mistake. So obviously the bigger the target attack surface we have to run at, the higher the chance there's gonna be that somebody's screwed up in one particular area. And on the flip side of that, oh, I didn't start my timer. All right. The more you scale stuff up, the more complexity is required to support that scale, which means there's more higher chance that somebody made a mistake that we can go after. The other thing that people often assume when we talk about hacking at scale, there are no talks from hackers about how I dealt with 100,000 reverse shells coming back to my interpreter. Because like, you don't, generally don't want to own every single server. You want to get yourself into a privileged position so you could own any server, not that you have. So hacking at scale isn't necessarily about getting lots of shells back. It's about getting access to important things. Okay, so lots of times people talk about hacking as, you know, we sent somebody a phishing email and we got their credentials done. Uh, we put malware on their computer, done. There was a SQL injection, done. But that's just the start of a hack. So if a criminal's actually attacking you, they're doing it for a reason. They're not doing it to pop up an XSS alert and go, ha, ha, ha. They're doing it because they want to steal money or get access to some critical information or what other things real bad guys do. Um, so there's a, there's a process, there's a chain of events, which I've kind of boiled down to these, these core things. Let me go through them. So the first thing is, is low-hanging fruit. So this is the initial vulnerability that we'll use to get in. And it's not necessarily going to be where we want it to be. We might go after something opportunistically to get in. And from there, we've got to move through the network and systems to get to a position of privilege where we can achieve our goals. So because we're not... You know, oftentimes we're an unprivileged user or we're in some shitty app that everyone forgot about. We need to now escalate our privileges on that host or across that app stack. And in doing that, we can then get access to more juicy things. So that will put us in a position of privilege on this old forgotten thing that we don't necessarily want to be on. So the next thing we've got to do is see if any of the stuff we can loot off of that server gives us access to other things across the network. And that's where we get to the, the lateral movement part of this. And Mary talked about this a bit in her talk, the idea that you compromise one server and then you can reuse credentials to get somewhere else. So that's the next part of the, the attack. You start moving around networks and systems, trying to see if you can get more and more access and privileges. Then the last part is the victory condition, whatever the bad guy came here to do. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example of that based on um, a hack we did where we could talk about it publicly. So unfortunately, lots of stuff we do we can't talk about publicly. But uh, for the South Africans in the room, you know my broadband? Yeah? So my broadband, um, I, I gave them the awkward um, question. I said, for this talk that you've asked me to do, can I hack you guys and then tell people how I did it? They're like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so they were really awesome about it. OK, so I can't sort of tell you exactly what I did, and the stuff's all been fixed. But initially, I found some old shitty server somewhere that everyone had forgotten about running old shitty open source software. I'm not saying open source is shitty. I'm saying that software was shitty. So I could 
spelunk through it looking for vulns. There were lots of vulns, and I was able to upload a PHP web shell. This is a free PHP web shell. It gives you lots of fancy things. So what that gave me was um, host level access to this old shitty web server that everyone had forgotten about. So it means I've got access to the file system, um, I've got access to some parts of the application. But I don't have root on the box, I don't necessarily have root on other applications. So I've now got to escalate my privileges, the step that I was talking about earlier. So I tried my hand at PowerPoint animations, and I'm really proud of it. So if you guys could just pretend like this is awesome, that'll be cool. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is said web server with classic clip art. And you can even see I used like free, animate, free clip art, so it's got those lines on, so to try and discourage you from using it in presentations. <laughs> yeah. So a server is not just a single server. It's made up of bits. So the bits I'm choosing to call out here is the application, the operating system, and the database. So right now, I've got unprivileged access to the operating system, and I've got low-level access to the application. So what I do is I rummage around the operating system. It's an old shitty server. It's been there for a while. Persistence is gross. And so there was a file somewhere which had credentials in it. So I could use those credentials to re-log into the application with a privileged user. That user had access to configuration files, which had the database connection string in it, which meant I could get access to the database. Cool, so at this point I had some more access than I started off with, I sort of escalated privileges. Uh, so this thing, I, I was on paternity leave at the time, which is, I was sort of, you can imagine me covered in baby spit up and at four in the morning doing this, and I was banging my head trying to figure out where to go to from here, and it, it took a, a little while. So that idea that hacking is finding the one place that somebody screwed up, it's long hours of frustration. We kind of show you the end path but it doesn't necessarily mean I just sort of went, ta-da. So I'm on this old shitty web server, which is the top left, and I want to get to the target server. So the target server is my broadband.co.za, and I want to get to their news thing, so their main news site. That's, that's the, the goodies that I'm going after. So I've got to get from there to there. So it turned out that this old shitty server's database had been migrated to a new, less shitty server, and that the credentials stayed the same. So I could log on to the new less shitty server with those credentials pivoting through the old server because they were connected on the same backend network. So that was great, but this database had, so there was an application hosted on the target server that this database was the backend for. But the application wasn't the application I wanted to log on to. It was something else. I can't really say what these things are. So. But it was enough for me to add myself as an admin user to this application I don't want access to on the server I do want access to. So again, PowerPoint animations, you know how long it took me to do that. <laughs> um, I just want to see it again. <laughs> Seriously, a curve, and you see how it bounces. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then on the target server with access to this shitty application, I could rip out the guts out of a CMS plugin, stick my web shell back in there, and now I had operating system level access to that server, um, as well as sort of low-level access to a particular application. Now this server, they'd locked down more, so instead of having the Apache user access, I had access as a specific user for that site. It's, I think it's mod sudo or something like that. Mod su. I don't know, I'm probably putting my foot in my mouth. Um, so I was on the target server, but not with the credentials I wanted. Now it turns out that there was another database connection string that I found somewhere on the operating system, which allowed me to connect to another database. This other database was the backing database for the application I did want access to on the target server. So there I replaced the admin hash with my own, and then I could log in to my broadband's main WordPress site as an admin user and, and post stuff. Huh? Huh? <laughs> and, and so the point I'm trying to demonstrate here is that lateral movement is, is a lot of the time taking non-obvious steps. It's not obvious to you as somebody designing a system that you can go from there to there to there. You think you've got these trust boundaries, but unless you actually enforce them, you don't know. And so in the end, I was able to, I just added a draft entry, which I thought would be non-threatening, and I made a file <laughs> um, in some place where they wouldn't see it. Uh, and then I just texted Jan from my broadband, and he said, no, everything was cool, but it turns out one of them wakes up really early in the morning, Kevin, and he logged on and thought they were about to get attacked with ransomware. <laughs> Someone was going to, like, encrypt all of their database posts and things like that. But they were really gracious about it, and they fixed the stuff super quickly, um, so, so it was really good. Anyway, so that's just a, an example of how those steps can fit together, from low-hanging fruit through to privilege escalation, lateral movement, and then the victory condition at the end. Okay, so let's go into those in a bit more detail. 
So looking at low-hanging fruit, this is really low-hanging fruit. <laughs> like I said, this is your initial in. It's the toehold within to your target environment. That said, attackers will often make decisions to try and help them get a little more lucky than just being lucky. So the, the one thing we'll look for is things which are going to be weaker. So in the case of my broadband, I know their forums have been the site of a thousand troll wars for the last 10 years. Their forums are probably battle-hardened. Hell, they've probably got alerts on like every time you add a user to that account because of all of the, the crap that they've had to deal with over the years. So I'm not going to go after their forums. Instead, I went looking for old forgotten things that nobody's necessarily maintaining. The other thing I'm looking for is things which would be connected to other things that can get me somewhere. So if there's a static website being hosted by some third-party marketing firm, I'm not necessarily that interested. There's not a high chance that credentials will be reused somewhere else because this is a third party, and it's not connected to a back-end network that gives me any advanced level of access. So I'm going to go after things which look like they're connected to other stuff. So bear that in mind when attackers are looking at your network. And I'm also looking for exploitable vulnerabilities. Now, you think this would be obvious. You run a vulnerability scanner, and it gives you critical high, medium, low. The criticals and highs, we just fix those, and exploitability is gone. But vulnerability scanners don't optimize for criticality. They optimize for things, common vulnerability scoring system, CVSS. So they'll, for example, make SSL vulnerabilities mediums. You could fail PCI with these SSL vulnerabilities. But for the most part, those are theoretical for us. Like, I'm not in a position to intercept this traffic and perform a complicated Poodle encryption attack. Uh, whereas if there's a SQL injection, that's great. That gives me direct command execution access. And so in the worst case scenario, what we'll see is you'll have informational findings, which will tell you there's a username enumeration. That's awesome for us, because on old shitty sites, the usernames and passwords are probably the same. Or they've got a password complexity enforced, which means I can bet that somebody's got a password of password one. Uh, so we look at informational findings, and sometimes that's our way in. So you've got to look at VulnScan output and sort of start thinking which of these things are exploitable. But let's talk a little bit more about cloudy scale stuff. So in 2010, we thought, hey, Memcache and Redis look like they're becoming a thing. Hackers are a bit slow. Uh, let's see if we can find any of these on the internet. And we found lots on the internet. And they were just unprotected, like Memcache owned documents. It's like, don't put this on the internet. It must be behind a firewall. We're not going to do auth. So this is PBS's website. In 2010, we sort of politely added our logo in the corner and contacted them, saying you should lock down your Memcache. Uh, and then, so Bitly's professional thing. We've got the password for editor at TechCrunch. And there were lots of examples. There were just tons of open memcache and Redis servers on the, the internet. Now, this was 2010. So you'd think, like, eight years later, the stuff would get better. And I originally had this in as a prediction. And then I was checking Twitter before this talk. And I saw this. No, this is... Ugh. I added a slide, but of course, didn't copy it. So I think yesterday, uh, there's a story going around about memcache. You go back one. Uh, memcache servers get, being used as an amplification attack for DDoS attacks. Because now there's 27, no, 17,000 of them online in Shodan, and they're using those to amplify these attacks. So it hasn't gotten better eight years later. But there's other places where it hasn't gotten better. So last week, Burger King was publicly shamed for leaving an open S3 bucket with 1,000 resumes, which obviously has personal information. In. Now, anyone here who's tried to do anything with S3 buckets recently will know you get prompted continuously. Like, this is public. Are, do you know that? Like, don't do this. It's going to be public. Oh, you've updated this file. I'm going to stop making it public. I mean, they make it really difficult to do boneheaded mistakes like this because of all of the attacks that have happened. But Burger King, supposedly people have been reporting this for seven months beforehand, and they didn't do anything until it went public. And then sort of the logical end game of this is you get these assholes installing ransomware. Well, either deleting all the data in people's open MongoDBs or encrypting it and then ransoming it, it back to them. I mean, so this vulnerability has gone from the theoretical state, theoretical but demonstrable state in 2010, to now there's people making money off this um, through criminal attacks. So these kind of low-hanging fruits in cloud environments uh, need to get better. Like, just remember that firewalls do exist. OK, so I was talking about low-hanging fruit. Now I want to talk about privilege escalation. So this complicated graph, don't worry too much about the, the detail. Uh, was drawn by a friend of mine, Sagi Shahar, who put together this training course of the numerous ways that you can perform privilege escalation attacks against Windows or Linux operating systems. And you can see there's a lot, lots of different ways. And that's really what I wanted to say in this slide. But if you remember from the My Broadband example I just gave you, privilege escalation is not necessarily just on one layer of the stack. You can go from application to database back to application and bounce around escalating that way. Sorry, I had some whiskey before this, and it was a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, and 
what we also find is that the, the longer a box has been around, the higher the chances are that something's been screwed up, that there's a database backup with bad file permissions somewhere, um, or files with bad file permissions, or all sorts of problems. And Mark will give you some examples of those. Uh, and so a guy named Dino Daisovi is quite a famous hacker. He came up with this, this phrase in 2011 in a talk that he did. Persistence is gross. You know, you want a, something where you can just hose down the vomit, you know, where vomit are hacks, rather than have it sitting around on your server for, for days. So speaking of, of persistence, that's why we have, we're moving to this wonderful world of containers, ephemeral apps, and less persistence. So I wanted to show you how that stuff can go wrong. So this is my laptop. And I really just wanted to put the screenshot up because I ran the command touch poo, which makes me very... <laughs> um, so I create a folder on my laptop, foo, and then it's got a pile, file called poo. So I run a Docker container, and I realize that people in the cheap seats probably can't see this. So at the... I can't see my mouse cursor either. All right, so the pink thing at the top is just the, the invocation for this Docker container. So it's Docker run. And I'm doing three things of interest. The first thing is I'm mapping that folder that I've created through to slash whatever. The second thing is I'm passing through the host networking through to the container with dash dash net host. And the third thing is I'm running it unprivileged, so dash you nobody. So I'm not running it as root, I'm running it as nobody. And I'm just, it's a Python container, I'm running bash. Now, because it shares networking with other containers, this particular attack is possible. And this was adapted from an actual compromise we had on an assessment. So what this Python's doing, doesn't, don't need to pay too much attention, is it opens up a Unix socket, and then it, um, gains, it opens up a file handle to slash whatever. So this container has access to slash whatever, but it has no privileges. So what I want to do is I want to use privileges from another container that doesn't have access to this thing to access this file path this, of this container, which does have it, which is not something you're supposed to be able to do in Docker. So this is the second container. Here I run it just with dash dash net host. So it's running at root, it's got root privileges and it's required. So here I run similar Python, except this connects to the Unix socket rather than listening for it. And because they're sharing host networking, you can do that. It then receives the, the file handle passed to it. It changes directory to that file handle. And because it's root, it can do that. Uh, and then it executes dash in that new new directory, that new path, which ends up with the awkward thing where you run present working directory and it tells you unreachable slash whatever. Um, and what you can see is I'm able to access my poo. But now I can access it as root in this container. So I've, I've moved from, I've used the access one container has and the access another container has, and the fact that they've got shared networking to provide this between them. Now obviously this is because I'm running on the same host. There's lots of ways of preventing this with namespaces and sec comp, and if you don't pass networking through, it's just to give you an idea that Docker containers aren't necessarily the security boundaries we'd hope they'd be yet. There are ways of making them more of a security boundary, but they're not always. And this also works from container to host. So if you passed host networking through, and host's running a vulnerable service that you can exploit, and you can run this stuff here, then you can get root on the host from root in a container. OK, so I was just talking about, uh, what was I talking about? Privilege escalation, now I'm moving to lateral movement. So there's this canonical quote amongst hackers, and 160 retweets counts as canonical amongst the hacking community. Uh, so there's a guy at Microsoft, John Lambert, and he, he has this phrase. So attackers think in graphs, defenders think in lists. So defenders have this idea of these servers are not allowed to talk to these servers, the firewall rules say so, done. Because attackers go, these servers can talk to these servers, which can talk to these servers, which can now talk to these servers. So attackers think in graphs, and defenders need to start thinking in graphs too. And so let me give you an example of that. I stole this from a website, 6dub.net, where it's describing a tool called Bloodhound, which is an attack tool specifically designed to map out attack graphs for attackers on active directory domains. So we can find the shortest path. So we managed to compromise workstation C, malware or a password or something. Workstation C has a user logged into it called Sally. And if you're familiar with Windows world, we either use wdigest, or we can extract the NTLM hash, or many other things that a tool called Mimikatz can do. So we can gain access to Sally's credentials or ability to authenticate across an active directory domain. Now, Sally is a member of a group called Workstation Admins. Workstation Admins means you can log into a whole bunch of different workstations. Workstation Admins can't log into Workstation A, the Network Ops Workstation, but it can log into Workstation B. So you log into Workstation B using Sally's credentials, and now you can get the credentials for Fred, who's in the Network Operations team. That group has access to a new set of laptops or workstations. Eventually, we can connect to workstation A. 
Tim is logged in there. Tim's a domain admin. We can steal his creds. Now we can log into an Active Directory domain controller and dump hashes and crack them and giggle. Or if we're real attackers, do something actually damaging. And so this is an example of how, much like with the My Broadband example, attackers can use the graph to move around laterally in ways that you didn't think people could. And the only way you'd validate whether this is possible is kind of by trying to do it yourself. So let me give you an example of that n not on systems. And so I think Jonathan's going to be mad at me. But, um, so there was internet drama. So what a surprise. Uh, so this guy from a, a company called Synac, he engaged in the, the bug bounty program that Instagram had on offer, or Facebook had on offer. And Instagram, I think, famously said that they'd pay out a million dollar bug bounty if there was one worth it. So this guy was super salty that he didn't get paid out his million dollar bug bounty and, and put that up. And so there was lots of drama, and eventually the CISO of Facebook like, phoned this guy's employer and said, make him stop, and then this guy got upset. The drama doesn't really matter. So what he did, and this is his diagram, so the MS Paint <laughs> skills are, are his, not mine. So there was this Ruby on Rails app called Sensu on Instagram. There was a vulnerability in it, which had actually already been reported to Instagram um, by somebody else with a bug bounty. It doesn't really matter what happened there, but there was a config file which had an AWS key in it. Using that AWS key, he could list all of Instagram's AWS S3 buckets, but he couldn't connect to most of them. He could only connect to one of them. So there was this one bucket called Autoscale. Is it still there? <laughs> it's not still there. And in that, there was another AWS key. With that AWS key, he could connect to a couple more buckets. In a couple more buckets, he found another AWS key, and then he could eventually connect to all the buckets. So you can immediately see why Instagram was rightly pissed off about this. The dude went way beyond the scope of what bug bounties should be doing and accessing all of Instagram. Um, and yeah, so this is an example of how you can sort of pivot through data stores. It's not just servers and SSH and those sort of credentials. And so when you're looking at your own network, there's kind of two nodes to watch out for. So if you start thinking about your, your stuff as a graph, there's two things to watch out for. So the one, I'm making up these terms, but I'm calling them sort of like privileged nodes. So that's either something that has privileges to lots of other things. So we've, we've seen instances where Splunk or SolarWinds gives us privileged access to all sorts of hosts. You know, no one like really thought SolarWinds was gonna be the critical security feature of their, their network. And in other cases, you just might have privileged accounts. So there's a domain admin token, or there's chef puppet Ansible creds or keys sitting somewhere that you can take and then pivot through the network to connect to other places. So those are privileged nodes. You've got to figure out which of those are places that um, are privileged and you need to watch out for, and how do you isolate those from the rest of your network? So a compromise of other things doesn't give you a compromise of them, and people are less likely to compromise them. But Mark's going to go in more detail on this. Sorry, wait, give me one second. And then the, the last thing is what I'm calling auth concentrations. So that, that might be data stores, so something like a MySQL database with a whole bunch of creds for an application. You can crack those hashes, and then if passwords are reused in places, or it could be places where people log into. So if you compromise an intranet or a service desk, and you can monitor traffic and watch logins, then you can also get lots of people's passwords, which looks great in a movie. You know, we call them cred fountains. So if, you, if you're looking at your network, you know, a lot of time people think about it as, okay, well, that's a critical application that does important things. These might not be critical applications. They might just have important security things on them. And so if you're here for Mary's talk, she had some really nice patterns for making this less of a problem. And Mark's going to, I'm going to hand over to Mark now, and he's going to talk about how he's done some of this stuff in our network that's, that's worked out quite well. Let me try the mic. Thanks, Tom. So, Dom's talk, talked about hacking the network, um, moving around. I'm hopefully going to talk about defending, um, and specifically lateral movement. Um, we've tackled these challenges. Um, we've scaled from 20-odd servers to 100-plus. So we're not quite Facebook, but you know, we're getting there. Um, and we feel that these principles can apply. You know, it doesn't matter what the scale. It seems supposed to be love baggy pants. Um, if you don't know what baggy pants are, it's um, basically if you leave your workstation unlocked, we like to um, teach or you know, enforce um, the locking of the workstation, and we'll do that by sending a message to everyone, telling everyone how baggy our pants are, you know, drinks on me, um, maybe set your homepage to something like Dodge. Um, this happened to me. 
but I wasn't so lucky to get, you know, baggy pants or my browser defaced. Um, they went straight for our internal Slack server. I was logged in as an admin, and they proceeded to give themselves admin, remove my admin, and then all the fun and games started. Um, so the big lesson here is that the principle here is trust owns. So the big takeaway was we shouldn't be using admin accounts as our normal day-to-day, -day, right? Um, so stand user accounts for me. If I need to do anything privileged, it's another browser, it's another machine, you know? It's like separate those two. Um, the same with the, the admin password. Uh, we've, got, we've taken the stance, different admin passwords all the, all, all the machines. So if a password is com compromised on your internal Slack, then they're not going to go and pwn your AD or you know, salary server or something like that. Um, we also don't allow like root logins and things like that. Um, how can we restrict the movement even more with the creds? Obviously, multi-factor auth. So why 2FA? Well, without it, it's super easy, right? If I find a login and I've got the creds, I'm in. But the 2FA adds that extra factor, so now the, the attacker needs to get really creative. So the creds are sort of a little bit more useless, and he's gonna to have to now maybe start having a look at the app stack, you know, is there vulnerabilities in that, is it patched, things like that. Um, we chose to use Duo. Yeah, you can see we've got um, a web login, we're doing an RDP session, and we've got an SSH session. So all of those are protected with 2FA. Um, the really cool thing with Duo, um, after you've been using um, Google Authenticator, is the thing, send me a push. So it doesn't even ask you for a code. It's just like, hey, do you want to allow? And you just, I mean, done with his watch. It's pretty cool. The other cool features, um, there's some serious device insight. So like, we don't run an enterprise mobile device management thing. Um, basically, the devices are used for two-factor auth. But we can get such a low-grained insight into the devices. We can stop people logging on with Duo um, if they don't have screen locks enabled or if they don't have fingerprints, disk encryption, if it's been tampered with, we can say, no, nah, you're not allowed to log in. I mean, you can really get nasty and start blocking on, on versions. I mean, as you can see with these, these Android versions, I mean, it's just ridiculous. So you can, you can block on Android versions, browsers, OS, I mean, even the Linux kernel version, if it's, if it's out of date, you know, you can block that. Um, what this really made us realize how terrible Android are at rolling updates. So, We've spoken about auth trust zones, so that's the separation of your standard user account with your admin account, right? Back in the day, when we used to run servers, we used to run everything on the tin. Not virtual machines, it's 20 different pieces of software with, you know, Nginx proxying things to different ports and you name it. Um, you compromise one thing, you don't even know you're running on this, this thing is running on the server. You compromise that, you've got access to everything, right? Um, and updates are a little bit harder because now to reboot the machine, you gotta reboot all these things, right? Um, so we had a machine, we had local access for, for our users. It was actually um, one of the services was a chat server and we had auto patching on there, it was awesome. But um, the one thing we didn't do was auto reboot. So kernel updates would patch, but you know, because we weren't in invoking auto reboot or a scheduled reboot, those things were just lying there. So the guys freaking ex exploited it, you know, one of the many that are possible. Kernel exploit, local Provesk, root user, game over. There the IRC war starts again. Um, so the big lesson here yeah, is we need to start splitting our servers up, right? So not a auth um, zone, it's now a server zone, right? But there's other things you can do. It's like you can reduce the tax service. So at SensePost, we could easily run a CMS like a WordPress or a Joomla, um, you know, MySQL database, PHP, all that rubbish. Um, but we're a security company. Vulnerabilities on that shit all the time. So um, we took a stance, all right, we're gonna go static. So we've got Jekyll, we've got a little bold thing. It builds, and what's awesome is we just push it to S3, we're cloud fronting the thing. You know what? No updates, no reboots. I'm sleeping wonderfully at night, you know? When I see those WordPress exploits coming up, I'm like, freaking sweet. <laughs> um, and it's great for public-facing stuff, right? It's like, it is public, everyone can see it. If I can put on a 
public buckets. It's awesome. So we move to virtual machines. And what, what, what does this give us? We're separating our services. So now, if you're after the chat server, fuck, you've got to go straight for the chat server or the hypervisor. You can't go for the WordPress thing, because that's only going to give you local access to that thing, right? We don't run Docker containers, so you're not going to be able to break out and go into the other container. So, so the big thing for us was moving to virtual machines. And we've just spoken about trust, uh, trust systems. And we want to take this a step further to a network um, network trust, network, network, network level trust. And basically what we did is we grouped our services, so like-minded services, um, you know, finance stuff, sales stuff, uh, techie stuff, um, grouped our networks, so we put them in all little, all little VLANs, isolated them from each other, VLAN, they have firewall the machines in that freaking network, so if databases need to talk to each other on database port, that's the only thing we're gonna open up. SSH, well, that's from an admin man, right? So as you can see in this diagram, we've got three types of access. We've got a common access, so that's pretty much everyone in the company. Payroll, well, not payroll, that would be the finance, right? It'll be leave booking forms, it'll be our document repositories, chat servers, and things like that, right? Then we've got special access, which would be for the finance staff, they need the payroll server, or the sales guy needs, guys need access to Salesforce. Um, and you've got the management plane, so this is really important. This is trying to keep everything on a separate subnet. Your hypervisors, your switches, and all those management interfaces, they're in sub separate subnets that aren't routable to these other guys. And only from your admin access, VLAN, are those interfaces allowed, if you know what I mean. So it's basically cr cr creating these different trust zones. So we've got common trust zones, we've got finance, sales, and we've got hardcore, you know, internal admin trust zones. Um, So you never get 100% protection, right? So you've got all these zones. We've got separation between our privileged, um, privileged and standard user accounts. We've separated our services. We've grouped them together into logical units. You know, if you pay in one thing, you're not going to be able to move laterally to the finance servers, hopefully. Um, but we had an incident where we had some malware being passed around on a USB. Went into one of um, our staff's laptop and the AV didn't pick it up, and it starts talking out onto the internet. But luckily, we had a snort intrusion, intrusion detection system. Um, so that alerted us, we picked it up, we're like, whoa, what the hell is this going on? The big lesson there was we need multiple layers for this stuff, right? So we made sure our email server has a different AV2 that's running on the workstations. Our finance guys actually have RDP workstations that they RDP to for financially things that they do, you know? So their workstations, if you pwn them on their local workstations, there's actually a lot that you're gonna get maybe email. Um, and yeah, we, we took the stance to put different AVs on their local workstations and their remote workstations. So if this AV kind of skips, hopefully that one's gonna detect, right? Um, there's some other tr t cheap tricks that you can do. So I mean, the big, the big takeaway here is we've created these, these trust zones, right? And you've got all these barriers, but now, how do you know that someone's actually in there, in there, moving around? <laughs> you know, someone's in there, you know, like moving around in your network, poking at stuff. So that's where like honeypots come in. So sticking the honeypots on your network, you know, the guys are poking around, now you're getting alerting on that call. Hey, someone's on the freaking network. Um, fail to ban's great, you know, put it on your, your web ports, your SSH servers, they start booting that thing, they get blocked and you get a little alert for that. Awesome. So, when, when we used to get hacked, I say used to, when we used to get hacked, I'd see the guys, you know, like huddle around a desk, and I'd be like, what's going on here? They start giggling, and they start doing this meerkat thing over, looking at me like, you know, and I just know something's going down, more guys joining around, it's just giggling, I'm like, oh, you know, they're up to something, I know it, you know, it's this excitement that they've pwned something, I'm like, my heart just sinks, you know, it's like, fuck. <laughs> so um, we've done all this stuff, and it's been a long time since I've had that feeling, right? We've like, we've got a bit of validation too. We've had like three pen tests from external companies. We've given them privileged access inside, inside network and said, listen, go mad. 
and we haven't had any major findings, right? So I think the big takeaway, and the, uh, the slides, the big take, fuck no. Yeah, no. So the big takeaway here is know your network. Know how the attacker can move around the network and start implementing these trust zones to kind of make it harder. I mean, we've done it and um, know that it's possible to create a network that is hard attack. That's it. Thank you. Awesome. Questions? We've got loads of time. <laughs> Hi there. Every now and again you see an article on the news about some guy being locked up or being sued because he reported a vulnerability at some place that's so happy or police that don't understand what they're doing. What is a good way to report vulnerabilities? Should you do it anonymously? Should you just try and ignore it? Because you don't ever know when you deal with the idiot on the other side. Um, so this is, there's like papers written about this over the last 20 years. It's probably one of the more controversial topics in our, in our industry. And um, I mean, that guy is going to argue with you. Whatever, anything I say, he's going to argue with me about. So the, the first thing is to make sure that you're not behaving unethically in doing this thing in the first place. So if you think about it, now, like, my neighbor might leave their door unlocked, but breaking into their house and cucking on their bed to prove to them <laughs> that they need to lock their door is still a bit antisocial. And they, they might not be so chuffed that I've, I've helped them understand their vulnerability. <laughs> so, you know, for a long time, it's, you know, where is this in the interest of the public good? And where is there an overriding intent to do, um, to, to make the world a better place? And a lot of the time, law comes down to intent. I'm not a lawyer, so don't quote me on that. And so if you're not doing this thing in an, in an don't be a dick when you're doing it. And then try and think about whether you, you have a legitimate reason to be doing this. So if there's a significant public interest that you could maybe justify. But a lot of the time, if you contact people and ask them whether it's okay if you do it, um, they can say yes. And if they react really negatively at you just asking in the first place, then you know they're probably going to react really negatively to you reporting it at a later stage. So I think this whole reporting it anonymously, yeah, you can do that, but it just makes it look more shady and maybe encourages you to be more shady. Um, and the other thing is there's no protection in law in South Africa for vulnerability research. None. There's, there's no, like, public interest clause. We've sort of been arguing for it with the cybercrime bill, and it's kind of sort of there. So the law is not on your side with this either. Um, that said, there's the bu bug bounty programs are trying to make that a little bit more legitimate. But even in the cases where there are bug bounty programs, Instagram's a, a good example of how somebody can still take it way too far, and they have to write nuanced things around it. So it's always going to be difficult. It's always going to be fraught. The more permission you can get up front, or the better common cause justification for public interest that you can write up front, the safer you'll be. Um, so this is about containers and um, clusters and things. So um, I've seen a pattern, I won't say where, but when if you somehow get control of a container, so you break an app, now you're in the containers context, and you have access to um, an internal network interface that like, if you go through it, you have access to all the clusters, apps, like you have access to the scheduler, you have access to the controllers, et cetera. So um, obviously, like once you breach that trust zone, it's like a free for all. Um, so the question is, have you seen anybody implement like a demilitarized zone um, behind like a internet facing containered app? Do you think that has a place, um, that kind of pattern has a place in containerized paradigms? Uh, okay, so short answer, no, I haven't seen it, but I'm also not, I haven't seen lots of big container deployments. 
Um, so don't take, I'm not authoritative on that. It sounds like a good idea. My, like, so for example, one of, one of two people who used to work for us now work at Heroku, so I've got a bit of insight in what they do, and they run these big public containers. So they've put a lot of work into hardening that container boundary. Uh, so they're using run C directly, they've got a lot more set comp stuff disabling kernel calls and things like that. So there's ways of hardening that container boundary so that it's less permeable. I mean, the default Docker set comp profile is pretty permissive because it needs to be for the general case. Yeah. So I think that's probably the first thing that you could do is make that, make that boundary a lot more intense. All right. uh, getting, I think if you're building front-end apps and back-end apps, like the DMZ stuff works, but I've yet to see anyone architect their apps in a way that uses a DMZ properly. Mm -hmm. So the point of a DMZ, and I'm not explaining for your benefit, maybe for others, is that uh, connection should only be initiated from high trust areas to low trust areas. But like, if you're connecting to a database from a web app, that's not how that connection works. The web app connects to the database, not the other way around. So your DMZ is defeated. And um, so the second people start building apps in a way that will be DMZ friendly, maybe I'd have a little bit more faith in DMZs. Right, but for now it's just hardening and that's it. Okay. But we just break stuff. You guys have to do the hard work. <laughs> Um, so you said that you'd moved your stuff to, into hypervisors, and I just want to get your view on the sort of Zen uh, versus KVM hypervisor models there and where, where your preferences lie. I, I know where mine are, and I was chatting to someone about this, so I'd just like to get some security input uh, around those questions in this day and age. I wouldn't know from a security standpoint. I mean, I can tell you what we use. We, we use KVM. Um, we haven't used Zen. Amazon moved from Zen. So, I mean, there must be a reason <laughs> to KVM. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe he could, he could uh, speak from a security standpoint, speak from an admin standpoint. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm certainly not authoritative on that at all. Uh, it seems that breakouts of those hypervisors are way less common than things like Docker. So, in general, it's a much more significant security boundary than, um, than run C is at the moment. But specifically between them, yeah, I'm not, I don't know. Um, you mentioned a lot of network layers on the security profile, but uh, didn't really go much into the local hardening of the systems. Um, SE Linux, um, integrity monitoring, file integrities, all of that sort of stuff, WAFs, what else can people do? Yeah, there's loads of stuff I think you can do. Um, yeah, app, app level protection, like using SE Linux, App Armor, those are definitely things you can look at. Um, yeah, application whitelisting, I mean, you use those apps for that. Um, what else? Yeah, I think there's, there's long, long lists of local host hardening that you can put in place. Uh, if for sort of general purpose, Machines, that, those are really long lists. If, there's a, if you check benchmarks.cissecurity.org, they've got these, these hardening guides, and then sort of, depending whether you want level one, level two, or level three, there's more things that can be put in place. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's probably a field in its, its own right. I think a lot of it will come down to what you're specifically doing, and to Mark's point, like for example with a website, how can you remove as much surface area, attack surface area as possible in the first place so that you've got less of that work to do afterwards? Um, I could add something to that. Um, we, we use Ansible as a configura configuration management. And what we do is, um, we do, there's a whole bunch of kernel patches that we, or kernel, you know, um, c c CTL stuff that we patch. Um, we harden SSH, you know, the SSH daemon. There's a bunch of stuff that we've got. I can't even remember what we do. Set up auto updates and things like that. Um, that's all done by default on all our Ansible, or all our machines we run Ansible role for that. Where is that question? One minute. Um, so you mentioned that uh, attackers think in terms of graphs and defenders think in terms of lists, but then um, Mark, you went on to give us a list of things that you've done. How do you, th how do you try and change your pattern of thinking to match that? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
can't remember the story of how pearls are made, but I think it's something to do with sand constantly grinding against them. Yeah, we're the sand in his soft bits that, uh, that encourage him to think that way, should we say. Um, I think it's like it's a real challenge. It's certainly, there's a lot of focus on that at the moment. If you've heard the term threat hunting, threat hunting is a lot about how do you think more in graphs and understand how attackers move around your network. Um, so I think the biggest change is not going, I've got an ACL that prevents this thing from going this thing, therefore it's enforced. Understanding that there are multiple ways people can move around this stuff. And you need to at least understand what those are. Uh, you can use attacker tools like Bloodhound on your own network and go, oh, there's a short path from here to here that I didn't think about, and maybe I can't get rid of it, so let's put some monitoring in place. If a new user's ever added there, if this credential's ever used there, you know, start putting those things in place based on a likely path that an attacker might traverse a graph. Sorry, we're out of time. Uh, thanks very much, Dominic and Mark.